Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Continuing with our journey through the book of Umdat al-Fiqh, Kitab al-Siyam. The Imam he talks today about Bab Siyam al the chapter of supererogatory fasting. Okay? That fasting which is not obligatory. Now, fasting in Islam, you have fasting which is obligatory, which is? Huh? Fasting obligatory such as? Ramadan and vows, okay? And vows. You have fasting which is haram, such as? The fasting of Eid and other things which will come to know. And the fasting of the one who is not allowed to fast, like the one who is ha'id, the menstruating woman, right? It's not uh, permissible for her to fast. The fasting which is makruh, disliked, for example. Okay, the, exactly, very good. The fasting, the day of doubt, okay? The 30th of uh, Sha'ban. Now we're going to do that which is mustahab, that which is mubah, that which is sunnah, the recommended fast, right? So the Imam, he says, Afdalu siyam, siyamu Dawood, alayhi salam, kana yasumu yawman wa yuftilu yawman. The best fast that you can do outside of the obligatory fast is the fasting of Dawood alayhi salam. He would fast one day and he would break his fast one day, okay? So he would fast for a day, the next day he would not fast. Tayyib, what about this person who fasts one day and then he doesn't fast a day, like the fasting of Dawood alayhi salam? But then he asks, what about the fasting of Monday and Thursday? What about the fasting of the three days in the middle of the month that the Prophet ﷺ said? I want to get the virtues of that. How can I achieve that? What do we say to this person? Do you get my question? This person is fasting a day and then he's not fasting a day. Is he going to be able to do the Monday and the Thursday fast by doing a day on and a day off? No, he's not going to be able to. Is he going to be able to do the three uh, fasts which are recommended in the middle of the month? No. So what do we say to him? We say to him, don't worry about those. We say to him, you are doing the best thing. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that the best of fasting is the fasting that Dawood used to do, which was to fast a day and not to fast a day. So that is the most virtuous thing that he is doing. طيب. وَأَفْطُلُ الصِّيَامِ بَعْدَ شَهْرِ رَمَضَانِ شَهْرُ اللَّهِ الَّذِي يَدْعُونَهُ المحرم. And the best fasting in terms of months, times to fast, is the fast after Ramadan, meaning uh, not the month of Ramadan, شَهْرُ اللَّهِ المحرم. The month of Muharram, right? وَمَا مِنْ أَيَّامِ الْعَمَلْ أَصَالِهُ فِيهِنَّ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ عَشْرِ ذِي الْحِجَّةِ There are no days wherein deeds are more virtuous in the sight of Allah than the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah. Okay, as mentioned in the hadith of Bukhari, Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu narrated that. Okay, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said there are no deeds which are more virtuous in the sight of Allah than the deeds done in the first ten days of Dhul Hijjah. Therefore, fasting is one of those deeds, right? And in that same hadith, Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu, the companions, they said, not even jihad, the Prophet of Allah. You're saying that there's no deed which is more beloved to Allah. They said, not even jihad. He said, no, not even jihad. Because they knew that that was the most virtuous deed. Except, the Prophet sallallahu said, a man that goes out with his wealth and his self, and he doesn't return with his wealth or his self meaning he's made shaheed in the path of Allah. That one is still better, okay? So in any case, the Imam, he's telling us that fasting, those days uh, from the first to the, and the ninth, not the tenth, why not the tenth? Because the tenth is Yawm Al-Eid, right? Is, uh, is something which is very virtuous. وَمَنْ صَامَ رَمَضَانَ وَأَتْبَعَهُ بِسِتٍ مِنَ الشَّوَالِ فَكَأَنَّمَا صَامَ دَهَرْ كُلُّهُ And whoever fasts Ramadan, and then he follows that up with six from Shawwal, then it's like he has fasted the whole year, as mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet. ﷺ. Why is this considered as though he's fasted the whole year? Hmm? Exactly, 30 times 10, 300. Then six of uh, Shawwal uh, times 10, 60, 360, as though you fasted the whole year, right? Um, can you fast the six of Shawwal? And you haven't fasted the whole of Ramadan. You've got to fast to make up for a month from Ramadan. Can you fast the six of Shawwal? Yes, according to the majority. The humble scholars said no. They said because the hadith is very clear. The Prophet said, Man saama Ramadan, thumma atba'ahu sit min Whoever fasts Ramadan then follows that up 
with six from Shawwal, right? But Shaykh Uthaymin ta'ala, he said, look, you hope in the mercy of Allah Azawajal that the one who didn't fast Ramadan for whatever reason, and he comes across the six of Shawwal or the Yawm Al-Arafah, then he should fast those Nafl fasts. And hopefully Allah Azawajal is so generous and merciful that he will give you the same reward. Okay? وَصِيَامُ يَوْمَ عَشُورَاءَ كَفَارَةُ سَنَةً and to fast the Yawm Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, is the expiation of one year, one year's sin. Which type of sins? Minor sins, not the major sins. Major sins always need for you to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yawm Al Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, how do we fast it? Is there anything we need to do? do we, can we just say fast the 10th of Muharram? You should fast a day before or the day after, right? So there's three levels to the fasting of uh, Muharram, Yawm Al-Ashura. You should fast the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th. This is the best. Okay, the second level, you should fast the 9th and the 10th, or the 10th and the 11th. The third level, which is permissible, you, should, you can fast only the 10th. Why did the Prophet ﷺ tell us to join other fasts to the 10th? The Jews at that time, he found them in Medina, only fasting the 10th. And the Prophet ﷺ was always keen to differ with the worship, of the Jews and the Christians. So what do we say about those Muslims who celebrate Christian today, Christ, uh, Christmas today, etc.? We tell them, look, the Prophet ﷺ would go to this extent, telling the people to differ in these acts of worship, right? And also, the benefit from fasting the three days is there may have been a mistake in the moon sighting. So if there was a mistake in the moon sighting, for sure one of those days, you will catch Yawm al-Ashura, the virtue of Yawm al-Ashura. Tayyib, the Imam says, وَسِيَامُ يَوْمَ arafa كَفَارَةُ sana sanatain. And the fasting of the day of Arafah is an expiation for two years, okay? The year before it of sins and the year that is to come after it. Tayyib. But the one who is making Hajj and he's there on Arafah is not recommended for him to fast. Why? Exactly. He needs that energy and strength to be standing there on the Mount Arafah and that area to be making dua to Allah Azawajal as much as he can. So it's recommended for that person not to fast. Okay? And it's recommended that the person fast the white days. The white days are known as the 13th of the month, the lunar month, the 14th and the 15th. Okay? So it's recommended to fast these days. Now this is based on the narration of Abu Darda that the Prophet ﷺ told him to fast these days. But in other narrations, it mentions any three days of the month. Okay? So the best is to fast those three days. But also, if you couldn't do those three days, you could do any three days in the month to still fall within the virtues mentioned in that hadith by the Prophet ﷺ. Wal-ithnayn wal-khamis. And to fast Monday and Thursday is also something which is highly recommended by the Prophet ﷺ. I'm not mentioning all the hadith pertaining to this to save us time, inshallah. Okay? Uh, generally, it's good to mention a hadith to learn how the ulama, they took the evidence from the hadith, right? But this is quite clear and quite straightforward, inshallah, and you can easily find the hadith pertaining to these issues. وَصَائِمُ الْمُتَطَوَّعُ أَمِيرُ نَفْسِهِ The one who is doing the supererogatory fast, he is the amir for himself. Meaning he's in charge of his act of worship. Meaning that Allah has given him freedom. What does this mean? Uh, if he wishes to, he can continue with the fast that he started or he can break it for whatever reason, right? And there's no qada upon him. There's no making up upon him. This is the nafil fast, the non-obligatory fast, right? But what is better? Is it better for him to complete? Or is it is better for him to complete always, right? But there's no haraj. There's nothing upon him if he decides he wants to break it, okay? His brother is telling him, look, come and eat with me, then it's okay for him to do so. There's nothing upon him, okay? But it's better for him to complete it if he's able to. Except for the Hajj and the Umrah, which is Nafal, for verily it is obligatory to complete that. And to make up that which he spoilt in those Hajj. The Imam, he says to us, And the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from fasting two days. Which two days? Eid, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha, okay? The Prophet ﷺ forbade us from fasting on these days. And 
and also the days of Tashriq, okay, which is the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th of Dhul Hijjah. These days, the Prophet ﷺ said they are for eating and drinking and celebrating, okay? So you're not allowed to fast on these days either. إِلَّا أَنَّهُ أَرْخَصَ فِي صَوْمِهَا لِلْمُتَّمَتِّعْ إِذَا لَمْ يَجِدْ الْحَدِي Except for the one who's doing Hajj at Tamattu'. Okay, this person, this type of Hajj, if he's doing that, and he cannot find the sacrificial animal, then this person can fast in place of that sacrificial, sacrificial animal. وَلَيْدُتُ الْقَدْرِ فِي الْوِتْرِ مِنَ الْعَشْرِ الْأَوَاخِرِ مِنْ رَمَضَانِ And Laydatul Qadr, the Imam is telling us, is in the last ten nights okay, of Ramadan. The last ten nights of Ramadan. Which nights? Even on the odd. Odd nights, right? Which is the most likely to be? A lot of the ulama, they say the 27th. But many of them, they say, in fact, this is something which is unknown, right? Because it jumps, every year it changes, they say. It changes from year to year, okay? It moves around. That's why the Prophet ﷺ, if you look in his uh, sunnah, what did he used to do? He used to do the whole 10 nights, right? He wouldn't just come out to the masjid like most people do, just for one particular night. That was never done by the Prophet ﷺ or the companions. Though it is narrated that many of the companions, they thought it was the 27th night. But don't rely upon that because the virtue of it is so great. A thousand months of worship. You don't want to miss that, right? So it's better to make the effort like the Prophet and the companions did. They would make the effort throughout the whole of those ten nights. Whoever gets up on this night of Laylatul Qadr with Iman and Ihtisab, then all of his sins, previous sins, are forgiven for him. What does it mean to have Iman and Ihtisab? Iman means you have faith in its obligation, that this is uh, obligatory uh, upon you, right? Or that this has been ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ihtisab is that you have hope and expectancy in the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't just do it culturally. Don't just do it because your family is doing it. Do it because you want that reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you are submitting to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in doing so. Some of the ulama like Imam al-Nawi rahimahullah ta'ala and Imam ibn Hajj al-Asqalani. I mean great imams, right? In Islam, Sunni Islam. They said that the reward, the complete reward... For Laylatul Qadr is only to the one who knows that he is on Laylatul Qadr. Okay? But Ibn Rajib, Ibn Rajib al Hanbali in Lata'if, uh, he said that no, it, that's not a condition. This is extra information, right? It's not a condition. And also the ulama, they say that it's not a condition that you, you, you uh, stay up the whole night. You should. You should stay up the whole night, but it's not a condition for you to get the virtue of that night. Right, whatever you are able to do so. Don't get me wrong, you should, you're aiming for the whole night. But if something forbids you, prevents you, then you still hope to get the reward of the whole night from Allah. So hope you get the reward of Laylatul Qadr, right? So don't be one of those who, you know, you missed half of it. Now you say, okay, I'm not going to bother. No. Laylatul Qadr, we don't behave like that. Okay, if you miss some of it, you stay up for the rest of it. Uh, so we spoke about voluntary fast, right? What is the situation with regards to the niyyah of the voluntary fast? How does it differ from the niyyah of the obligatory fast? Exactly. You can make the intention later on in the day. It doesn't have to be before Fajr. Whereas the obligatory fast has to be before Fajr. Okay? You, can, you have to make it before Fajr. Babul uh, i'tikaf. We still have 10 to 15 minutes, inshallah. Babul i'tikaf. The Imam is speaking now about the act of worship which is normally done in Ramadan, which is known as Al-I'tikaf. Okay? وَهُوَ لُزُومُ الْمَسْجِدِ وَهُوَ لُزُومُ الْمَسْجِدِ لِطَعَةِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فِي And it is to seclude yourself and to commit yourself to a masjid to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that masjid. Okay? So the scholars, they talk about the fact that, you know, like you have prayer rooms. It's not known to be a masjid. It's not a, a regular masjid. They say in those type of prayer rooms and musallas, you can't do this etikaf. It has to be a masjid, okay? It has to be a masjid. وَأَنْتُمْ آكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah. So he mentions masajid. وَهُوَ sunnah, And it's something which is sunnah, it's not something which is obligatory. The majority of the ulama, they say that etikaf can also be done outside of the month of Ramadan. It's not something which is specific only to Ramadan, okay? And they say that etikaf it doesn't have to be connected to fasting. 
Meaning you don't have to be fasting in order for you to do etikaf. Okay? You don't have to be. What is the duration of time for the etikaf? Is there a minimum duration of time? The majority, they say one hour, right? One hour, one hour, sa, one hour. Others, they say anything which you can intend, anything which you're able to do, okay? But of course, in Ramadan, the last 10 nights is the best as that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. طيب. إِلَّا إِنْ يَكُونُوا نَذْرًا فَلْيَلْزَمُوا وَفَاءُوا بِهِ The Imam, he's saying this is sunnah, right? To do atikah. He said, unless you put a vow upon yourself, if you vowed to do it, you made a vow to Allah to do it, then in this situation, it becomes obligatory upon you. Okay? Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari, مَنْ نَذْرَ أَنْ يُطِعَ اللَّهِ فَلْيُطِعْهُ وَمَنْ نَذْرَ أَنْ يَعْصِيَ اللَّهِ فَلَا يَعْصِيهِ Whoever made a vow to obey Allah جل, then he should go ahead and fulfill that vow. And whoever vowed to disobey Allah جل, then he should never fulfill that vow. The Imam, he says, وَيُسِحُّ مِنَ الْمَرْأَةِ فِي كُلِّ مَسْجِدِ وَيُسِحُّ مِنَ الْمَرْأَةِ تِي فِي كُلِّ مَسْجِدِ And for the woman, she is able to do it in all masjids. Any masjid, which is a regular masjid, she is able to do i'tikaf in that masjid. طيب. غير مسجدها, except for the masjid which she has taken as a place of worship in her house. Okay? Because you know a lot of the Salaf and the righteous people, they take a part of their house, which they make to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this doesn't qualify. وَلَا يُسَحُوا مِنَ الرَّجُلْ إِلَّا فِي مَسْجِدْ تُقَامْ فِي الْجَمَاعَةِ But it's not permissible for the man to do the i'tikaf except in a masjid where they have five daily prayers. Why is that the case? Because the, the man has to, it's obligatory upon the man to pray in the masjid, right? So if there were no five daily prayers there, he would, every time he hears the adhan, he has to leave his masjid of i'tikaf to respond to the adhan, right? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever hears the adhan and doesn't respond, so there's no prayer for him, unless he had an excuse. So praying in the masjid is obligatory for the men, right? And for him to make i'tikaf in a masjid, a jami'ah, where they have jum'ah, is better. Why is that the case? Again, same thing, he has to get out the masjid to pray. وَمَنْ نَذْرَ الْإِعْتِكَافِ أَوْ صَلَى فِي مَسْجِدْ فَلَهُ فِعْلُ ذَلِكْ فِي غَيْرِهِ إِلَّا الْمَسَاجِدْ الثلاث. And whoever makes a vow to pray in a particular masjid, sorry, to pray in a particular masjid or to make i'tikaf in a particular masjid, then it's permissible for him to fulfill that vow in any masjid. He made it, I want to make i'tikaf in this masjid, right? This particular masjid here. But then he had a reason to travel. So it's permissible for him to fulfill that vow of prayer or i'tikaf in any masjid, right? فَإِذَا نَذْرَ ذَلِكَ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ لَزِمَهُ But if he made the vow to make i'tikaf in the masjid al-haram in Mecca, then he has to do it there. Why? Because there's nothing else like masjid al-haram, right? No other masjid equates it in its virtue. Nothing else, no other masjid is similar to it. So the previous mas'ala, we said a person made a vow in a particular masjid. He can do it in any masjid because all the masjid are the same, except for the three, right? The, pro, the Masjid Al-Haram, the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid and Masjid Al-Aqsa. These have three different, these have a different status. وَإِنْ نَذْرَ الْإِعْتِكَافِ فِي مَسْجِدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ جَازَ لَهُ إِنْ يَعْتَكِفَ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَحْدَهُ So now, another situation, a person makes the vow to make i'tikaf in the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he can make i'tikaf in the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or Masjid Al-Haram. Why Masjid Al-Haram? Because it's better than the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, right? But he cannot do it other than those two masajid. وَإِن نَذْرَ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ الْأَقْصَى فَلَهُ فِعْلُهُ فِي أَيِّهِمَا أَحَبْ But if he makes the vow for i'tikaf in Masjid Al-Aqsa, he can do it in any one of the three. Okay, because the two, Masjid Al-Nabi and Masjid Al-Haram are higher, he can go higher. And Masjid Al-Aqsa, he can do it in Masjid Al-Aqsa if he so wishes. وَيُسْتَحَبُّ لِلْمَعْتَكِفْ الْإِشْتِغَالِ بِالْقُرْبِ And it's virtuous and recommended for the one who's making i'tikaf to keep himself busy worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which type of worship? Worship which benefits him, not worship which benefits other people. So he shouldn't be in the masjid giving lessons. He shouldn't be in masjid reciting Quran for other people. He shouldn't be in the masjid teaching, etc. Right? It should be only a worship between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. غَيْرُ الْمُتَعَدِّي The ulama they say, right? 
وَاجْتِنَابُ مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ مِنْ قَوْلٍ وَفِعْلٍ And to abstain from that which, which doesn't concern him. Okay? مِنْ حُسْنِ الْإِسْلَامِ الْمَرْءِ تَرْكُهُ مَا لَا يَعْنِيهِ The Prophet ﷺ said, from the goodness of one's Islam is to leave alone that which doesn't benefit him. So more so in the masjid, when the person is making itikaf, he secluded himself to worship Allah. He secluded himself because he knows that in these moments, the gates of Jannah are open. He doesn't want to be pulled back from walking through those gates of Jannah. So that's what the person has to remind himself with. I'm walking now through the gates of Jannah. Don't allow myself to be pulled back by anybody or by anything. Focus solely on that walking through the gates. But if he was to do something outside of worshipping Allah, then it doesn't break his i'tikaf. And he should not leave the masjid unless there is something which necessitates that, something which is a necessity. He cannot uh, not do that, okay? In that situation, he's allowed to leave the masjid. Unless he makes a condition with Allah before he went into itikaf. So his father is sick. La samahallah. So he makes a condition with Allah that Allah wants to do itikaf, but my father is going to need me twice a day or once a day. So for that situation, I'm going to go out and fulfill his needs, okay? So in situations like that, because he's made a vow, uh, so he's made a condition, then he's allowed to do that. وَلَا يُبَاشِرُوا imra'ah, And nor is he allowed to, um, you know, uh, have relationships or touch any of his women. وَإِنْ سَأَلَ عَنِ الْمَرِيدِ أَوْ غَيْرِهِ فِي الطَّرِيقِهِ وَلَمْ يُعَرَّجْ إِلَيْهِ جَاز And as he's going to the masjid, he can ask about the situation of a sick person uh, and things like that. Now. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any mistakes and shortcomings from myself and shaitan. If you have any further questions or clarifications, then feel free. Before we start, we have a few review questions, inshallah, for the previous lessons. Question number one, and please raise your hand when you answer the question. Uh, question number one, a traveler is returning from a journey during the day and he wants to eat. What is the ruling for that? A traveler has been on a journey for a few days, so he's had his fast broken, but now he's returned to his residence, let's say midday, and he wants to eat. What is the ruling for that? He's not allowed to eat, he has to make imsak. Okay, this is one of the categories that we said that he has to make imsak. And old man question number two, an old man who cannot fast. He's unable to fast due to his old age. He travels. Does he have to pay fidya? Because you know that the fasting person, if he travels, he's exempt from fasting. Right? This old man who doesn't have to fast because of his old age, when he travels, does he have to pay the fidya? We said the imam, he said yes. Okay, we said Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala said yes. Because it doesn't matter the Hanbali scholars, they said, no, you're correct in that. Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, yes, because it doesn't matter whether the person is resident or not resident, okay? Because it's not to do with the fasting, it's to do with the fact that he's not fasting. He's unable to fast. So he would pay the fidya whether he's resident or whether he's a traveler, okay? If one is able to fast, that's where the uh, situation arises, that he's, he can choose not to fast whilst traveling. Is kafara, question number three, is the kafara for jima? for having uh, full relationships with your spouse. Is this ala tartib or ala takhir? Tartib means do you have to do it in order or takhir means you can choose one of the three? Yeah. Raise your hands, yeah? It's consecutively ala tartib, huh? So you cannot choose. You cannot say, okay, you know, I feel like fasting two months, that's what I'm gonna do. Or I feel like feeding the poor, okay? So what it is, you have to do it ala tartib. This is the majority opinion. If you cannot feed the slave, then you go to the fasting two months consecutively. If you cannot do that, then you go to the feeding of the poor. So it's ala tartib. Question number four. A person delays making up his fasts uh, until the next Ramadan without excuse. What is the fatwa here? What does he have to do? A person has delayed making up previous fasts from Ramadan until the next Ramadan arrives and he doesn't have an excuse, what's upon this person? Uh, 
So he has to make up the fast, bila shak. In all cases, he has to make up the fast. What else does he have to do? We said. Huh? He has to pay fidya. For each day he delayed, not each day he delayed, for each fast that he delayed, as well as making it up, he has to pay to feed a poor person. Okay? This is for the one who delays without excuse. Tayyib? A person has a very strong fever, shaking with cold, sweating, etc. Uh, lots of pain in their body. What is the ruling for this person? If he feels it's going to harm him or become worse, or the fasting will cause a delay in the person getting better, then the person can break their fast, make it up at another time. What if fasting for a sick person causes his harm, causes him harm? So a person is sick, not only will it delay the person's recovery, it will cause the person further harm. He's exempt or he has to be exempt? He has to not fast, right? His hair is not permissible for him to fast, right? Because la darar wa la dirar. Don't cause harm and do not bring harm to yourself, right? The Prophet ﷺ said. Tayyip, question number six. A person finds no difficulty in traveling and fasting. What should this person do? person is traveling beyond 80 kilometers, finds no difficulty fasting while traveling. What should they do? He should fast, huh? Anybody else? It's preferable according to the Imam and of the Hanbali Madhab for him not to fast, okay? The others, they say he should fast because then he catches the virtue of the month and it's easier to fast with the people. But our Imam, he said, it's better to take the ruqsa, the concession which Allah has given you, as the Prophet said that Allah has given us a concession in some ahadith. Question number seven. A woman breaks a fast fearing for her baby. What does she do? She breaks the fast out of fear for the health of her baby in her stomach. She has to make it up for sure. What else does she have to do? She has to pay a fidya, she has to feed a poor person for every day that she does not fast. If she fears for herself only, what does she have to do? So the first question was fearing for the child. Now I'm asking if she fears for herself only. Only make up the fast. If she fears for herself and the child, third situation. Huh? No, it goes with the mother. Okay? So again, just make up the fast. If she fears for the child alone, that's where she does the increase in having to make the fidya. If it's for herself or for herself and the child, then she just has to make it up, okay? Um, question number eight. One decides to break the fast. He decides, he has intention to break the fast. But he doesn't find food or drink until Maghrib. One o'clock, oh man, this is too much for me. I'm breaking my fast. But he doesn't find food or drink until Maghrib. He's broken his fast, broken his fast by virtue of him making the intention to break the fast, okay? By the, uh, as soon as he made the clear intention, I'm going to break my fast, that's when his fast was broken, regardless of whether he ate or drank. Uh, where am I? Question? Huh? Yeah, it's in the last lesson. We took it. Because, because of the hadith of the niyyah, there has to be jazm, there has to be uh, firm intention. So if you've had firm intention to break it, Regardless if you act upon it or not, enough was your intention to break it. Because like in, you have an intention to start the action, also an intention can break the action. طيب. And even some ulama, they said, taraddud fin niya. Taraddud meaning you're not sure. You know, if I come across food, I'll break it. If I don't, then I'll continue. This is going back and forth with intention. Even that, according to some ulama, breaks the intention. Because what you need is a niya to jazima, a, a, a strict, um, yeah, a solid intention. طيب. Number nine, a person swallows paper intentionally. What is the ruling of his fast? Intentionally. His fast is broken. Probably you say to him, you don't have to fast, right? You're crazy. The <laughs> pen is lifted from you. But you're right. The person who swallows paper intentionally, his fast is broken because the Imam uh, and the Hanbali scholars, they said anything which passes through the mouth, whether it's nutritious or not nutritious, breaks the fast. The opinion of Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, which is Allah Alim, uh, seems to be a more correct opinion, and Allah knows best, is that only that which is 
in the meaning of food and drink. Only that which comes under the meaning of food and drink, nutritious, breaks your fast. Okay? Because the verses of fasting were revealed to a people who understood that. That kulu uh, washrabu, eat and drink, right? It was understood what eating and drink, drinking meant at that time when the verses were revealed to mean physical food and physical drink, okay, which is nourishing. So anything according to the majority and our, our imam that passes your throat breaks your fast, whether it's nutritious or not nutritious. Um, eye drops and air drops. What is the ruling of eye drops and air drops? What did we say? If it comes to the throat, it breaks your fast, right? If it doesn't, then it doesn't break your fast. Uh, somebody vomits. What's the ruling of his fast? Oh, his fast is broken. Any more information? If he intended to break his fast, meaning, sorry, he intended to vomit. Okay, he caused himself to vomit. Then that person's fast is broken. If it was unintentional, the vomit over, he was overcome by vomit, then that person's fast is not broken. Question number 12. Someone continues to look at that which causes him excitement. What's the ruling of his fast? So, yeah, somebody is looking at his wife continually and it causes him excitement, arousal. What's the ruling of his fast? Very good. Mm. Yeah, very good. But that's only half the answer. He broke his fast because he had control over the action. I mean, he was looking continually, right? If it happened by just one look, then he's not breaking his fast, right? Because he's not in control of that. The one look you are forgiven. But also we have to add to the answer if the money or the madhi came out. Okay, if the semen came out, then it breaks the fast, okay? So if the semen comes out, then it breaks the fast. Tayyib, a few more, if you don't mind. Uh, what's the ruling on hijama and fasting? Cupping, bloodletting. Fasting not valid for who? The person who's doing it? Okay, for the doer and the one who it is done to, al-hajim wal mahjum, as the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Imam Ahmad. Okay, both of them, according to uh, our Imam and the Hanbali scholars. The majority they said no. They said it breaks only if it makes you weak. Okay, if the amount of blood taken out makes you weak. Um, somebody eats forgetfully in Ramadan, in the day of Ramadan doesn't break away right? because we said that that which is done forgetfully or unintentionally or based on not based on knowledge then that is overlooked Tayyip. and it's interesting to note that some of the ulama they even discussed if you see somebody during the day eating or drinking right uh, forgetfully should you remind him or not so the majority said yeah remind him because he's supposed to be fasting right some said don't remind him because this is from Allah جل, as the hadith said Verily, Allah is feeding him and gave him drink. So they said this is a special risk from Allah. But anyway, that's just interesting. Tayyip, um, question 17. If one is unconscious the whole day, what is the situation of his fast? I don't think we discussed this, but just interestingly, somebody's unconscious the whole day. It's not what? No, what's the situation of his fast? Is it valid or invalid? That's. Okay, yeah. So his fast is uh, invalid because he didn't fast, right? But if somebody slept during the whole day, okay, their fast is still valid, okay? If they had the intention to fast. But not for the one who is unconscious. They say the difference is that the one unco unconscious has no faculty about him. Whereas the sleeping one, you can easily wake him up. So he has some faculty about him. The pen is not uh, completely lifted in this situation. Allah knows best. Uh, somebody takes... Sleeping? Yeah. Yeah, his fast is valid because part of the day, he got part of the day fasting. Yeah, his fast is valid. Next question, somebody takes an injection of glucose. What is the ruling of that? Huh? Why? Glucose is nutritious and is going in your bloodstream, okay? Very good. 
Uh, one has to make a kafara of two months, right? Due to having relationships with his family. He travels on the 50th day. What's the ruling of his uh, kafara? Does he have to restart it? Yes. Anything else to add to that? He's right, yes. But there's another situation. We said if he has to travel, la mahala, meaning he, he's no choice, he has to travel for whatever reason, then here the kafara is not broken. He can continue when he comes back, okay? But it's if you travel out of choice, okay? If you break the consecutiveness, is that a word? Consecutiveness of the kafara, not out of choice, out of necessity like Eid fell in between, okay? Then that doesn't affect the continuity of that two month kafara, right? What affects it if you do it out of choice? Tayyip. Someone has a kafara to make, but he can't free the slave. He cannot fast, nor can he feed the poor. What's this, his situation? He has the kafara to make for relationships with his wife, but he cannot find someone to free. He cannot feed two whole months because it's too, it will harm him. And he cannot feed poor because he doesn't have enough money for that. What's his situation? Yes, David. He's good, right? He's, it's nothing upon him, exactly. Fattakullah mastata'atum. You fear Allah to the best of your ability. You don't have the ability, the, the situation is removed from you. Somebody swallows his saliva. What's the ruling? His fast is still valid. Somebody swallows his saliva mixed with blood. Hmm? What did you say? It's still valid. Pardon? Yes, yeah, so he swallowed it with the blood. Blood is considered to be food. Okay? Because in the verses where Allah says that this such and such has been made haram upon you, one of the things which you mentioned was blood. Okay? In the term, context of food. So if you swallow blood, Tayyip, we continue. No, anything which breaks the fast unintentionally, anything from the matters which break a fast. If done unintentionally, it doesn't break your fast. Tayyip? That's, that's one of the three things we said. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're brushing your teeth or something, huh? Just gen. Allah, I don't know. But the... I don't want to say because I, I can't remember exactly, but um, I'm leaning towards the rule still applies. If it's unintentional, it doesn't break your fast. But it's better to check, inshallah. 